but I do want to change, I want to really start uh, pulling the audience in as fast as possible, as fast as possible. The other thing I think might be useful is, uh, I'm Bill McDonough, and if you want to ask a question, at least in my sense, I'd like to hear your name also, if I can uh, get it. So, what I chose was a uh, sort of a framework of two slides that look like the, this, this and the next one look the same. And um, at some level, I got some input from some of my colleagues because I was here for the last week. And one of the first statements was, well, these are all the pr topics that the outstanding issues. And I said, good, did I miss any? Let's find out. Um, so the other point right away, outstanding issues, think research topics for weeks three and four. At the end of this week, um, Friday afternoon, Friday afternoon, we'll actually move the screen up and get out the whiteboard and you'll say, oh, I want to study this topic. And I can't remember, but in the past we've had like 30 or 40 topics and two people in each topic and that's not possible. We end up with, I don't know, five to seven topics and five to seven people in, in the group and the five to seven people in the research group really represent the four major disciplinary areas. And I, I sort of say areas because, uh, you know, for, for me, as I was growing up in the business, there'd be petrologists and mineral physicists, but somehow petrologists and mineral physicists all become one. And you could be a petrologist geochemist. And so I don't know. It's we absorb you. We, oh, good. <laughs> well, I, actually, to, you know, Quentin, I'm a, I'm a closet mineral physicist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me just sort of start talking about various. This is really my view of the Earth, and my view of the Earth and also other planets really come from starting out with some of the big questions. Um, composition of the lower mantle. For me, this is framed as uh, I'd like to think about the composition of the Earth, and um, I don't have to worry about the core because I've solved that problem, right, Jackie? Haven't I? <laughs> um, but now I want to just sort of say, what do we know about the mantle? Well, in fact, I want to highlight that uh, uh, we know a lot and we know a little. And there are some very, very big questions. And, and in fact, I can say, I highlight that I've put out a model for the composition of the Earth, and a, a good colleague, uh, Mark Chabot, has put out a model for the composition of the Earth. And they're two very, very different Earths. Um, and, and when I've made some presentations to particle physicists, because I, I work in this field, and I promised I'd say the word geoneutrinos pretty early on in my life. <laughs> um, they don't seem to understand fully why we're still having this debate about uh, the composition of the mantle. And what it turns out, when Marc Javois thinks about the mantle, he and I agree. The upper mantle is well defined. So when we get samples from basalts and when we get samples from um, the mantle, that is uh, major tectonic thrust of mantle thrown up there, or we get xenoliths that are brought up by volcanoes, we see lurzolite, and in fact we say the mantle has, that portion of the mantle has something like 45 weight percent uh, SiO2 and something like 38 weight percent MgO. However, and, oh, and the other thing that's happened, especially since about the 90s, we sort of had seismologists imaging slabs penetrating through the uh, transition zone into the deep mantle. And, and what we've finessed in the last uh, 15, 20 years is, well, some of them spend a fair amount of residence in the transition zone, but others go down, okay? So I don't care. Basically, the bottom line is we have mass transfer at some level between the upper mantle and the lower mantle. When faced with that issue, a very famous geochemist, Claude Alleg, he sort of says, yes, but it's only happened in the last 300 million years. So basically, there is a family of geochemists that basically think that deep in the Earth's interior, we have a one source of lavas that have certain special noble gas attributes that require us to keep two reservoirs separate from one another. As a result of that, we consequently sometimes we'll sort of envision that the upper and lower mantle are distinctly different. And if you mark Javois, you have a very different compositional model for the Earth's bulk mantle. And then that says that the lower mantle, in terms of major elements, not trace elements, not noble gases, but major elements, are quite different. So to put that in perspective, I, I could easily say the proportion of ferropericlase, in some people's models, it may be down as low as 
negligible amounts of ferropericlase. And some other people's models, say mine, I'd like 15 or, or a bit more percent mode proportion of fer ferropericlase. And this is just really uh, a major issue. What is the mode proportions? Well, you know, if you go, I'll, I'll switch right away. Uh, you go down to mineral physics. Mineral physics is fundamentally important because it's going to tell us about the elastic properties of those minerals, and this is where we start to work together. I have a model. Mark has a model. Two geochemists. We have opposing models. Some of these got to be right, and some of these got to be wrong. We turn to the mineral physicists. Yes. Oh, sorry. I never, I, I never entertained that idea. But, <laughs> but she, very right, right? <laughs> Uh, the uh, mineral physicists begin to parameterize the elastic properties of these phases, and, and fa fabulous work is, is being done. I can think of a nice paper uh, in uh, Nature in 2012 uh, by Murakami, in which he actually was able to measure some of the elastic properties of uh, magnesium perovskite, and he basically then compared what would be a mix of phase A, B, and C, proportions X, Y, and Z, and then said, these results actually compel me, when compared to PREM, a reference earth seismological model, to say that the lower mantle is uh, chondritic, which is an extremely misleading term because really he was really saying that the Mg to Si ratio was like that in C1, which is not like that in my earth. And if you would like, to, I'd welcome you to my earth, which has a very different magnesium silica ratio. So in fact, uh, Jackie helped me out to sort of explain what is the uncertainties in mineral physics. And this is actually where I think we've matured to. Now we have wonderful, wonderful models. And oftentimes, it doesn't matter if you're a geochemist, a mineral physicist, or a seismologist like Adam, who's put out PREM, there is no uncertainty on the PREM model. Adam, please help us. We have, we have a, he is helping, indeed. We have a really important effort that really, I think this is where we're moving towards, is actually characterizing the Earth and its attributes and putting forth uncertainties. What is typical of a geochemist is we'll measure this rock with just fabulous uncertainties, like as in the 142 neodymium. Differences in the parts per million level of an isotope ratio. However, we can speak with extreme authorities about five grams of rock. We cannot speak about, you know, with extreme authority about uh, 10 to the 20 kilograms of rock, which is really very, very important. So when a geochemist espouses the composition of the lower mantle as X or Y, um, I have to remind you, we only get samples from the upper mantle that may have been in residence of the lower mantle, but we really don't know that for certain. So really, the sort of proportion of ferropericlase is never going to be resolved by a geochemist. We're going to put forward a model, but we're really going to heavily depend upon the mineral physicists to put together the elastic properties of those phases. And they're going to have to look to the seismological signature, and they're going to have to actually propagate their uncertainties, because one of the uh, discussions I had with uh, Murakami-san was to really say, what is the uncertainty on your, your, your uh, elastic measurements, and how do you treat the uncertainty in the PREM model? Okay, and therefore, how can you assert that the composition of lower mantle is close to that of C1 chondrite? Can you eliminate my model? He wasn't ready to say that, but I knew he could not eliminate my model because we really have considerable uncertainties. And that's not to say that we're negligent. It's just to say it's very, very difficult to actually parameterize that. Excellent. Well, you know, it all depends. Am I asking the question, composition of low mantle without my glasses is a homogeneous body? <laughs> and, and, and if I put it on with my glasses, I definitely see the heterogeneities. Well, <laughs> 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 it's important when you mention friends and the uncertainties in friends, you may have to forget about 1B. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the notion of uncertainty is not, you know, not, not being really fundamentally. I mean, it's not the right notion to have. Uh, 
So my fundamental role is to disagree with everybody. I'm going to stop by disagreeing with Barbara, the leader of the pack. <laughs> what I want to do is I do want to talk about a 1D model of the Earth and a 3D model of the Earth. So I very, very much appreciate both aspects. Uh, at some level, the lower mantle has to be characterized as either being like the upper mantle or not being like the upper mantle at the major element level. When I think about trace elements, I instantly go and I say, you know, one of the things that it really I put I start scratching the heck out of the head is when I see Sujoy in the back of the room and he tells me, look at Bill, the xenon, I oh, wait a minute, sorry, for those of you who aren't geochemist aficionados, we're going to absolutely drive you crazy and the geochemistry team really will try and do our best because we've talked about this. We talk about too many isotope systems. Okay, sorry. So. Can I just come back to, when Adam was talking last Right. It's an average of two things, and the average might not represent anything. Right. And, and the effort by Ved, Barber, and others to, you know, to sort of move into the, the frontier question is to say that uh, the Wundy model has served us for, what, 40 years? Well, it's more than that. More than that, there was Bullen's yeah. model. A Bullen's model, right. So we've, for a century now, we've enjoyed a somewhat 1D model of the Earth. And when we move forward, and maybe we might have five different attributes of what might be the 3D mantle structure, we will recognize right away, we still need a 1D reference frame because I'll tell you, the particle physicist just said, I don't care about the details. Just give me the 1D model. And we need the 3D uh, resolvable phenomena where we look at the heterogeneity. Who was Jackie? Mm -hmm. But it really is a model, like a 1D model division, because the last time you talked about how you have morph source versus the OIB source, and the morph source is as much as 80%. That means that's not going to divide at the upper lower mantle boundary. And Just Adam talked around. about how you actually, you really have to look at 3D. Therefore, I think the compositional boundary is probably not a single layer, but it's a very complicated three-dimensional contour. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, did she just asked, oh, who is it I talked to? I talked to Bruce. She asked me if I would give a presentation about a research talk by uh, uh, Andre Schramick's uh, three-dimensional model of tomographic Im imaging of the Earth's interior. Completely agree. I mean, if we go back to, to Sujoy's Earth, uh, you know, I can't stand sometimes living in Sujoy's Earth. He has definable parameter space, xenon isotopes, that I agree with him. We have to somehow have a, a, a lockbox in the deep mantle in which we every once in a while throw a few atoms of xenon into it, and then it comes up and you go, ah, the Hawaiian lavas, I know that they will fundamentally have seen the formation of the continental crust. They've fundamentally seen it. But at the same time, they have the atoms of xenon that says they've been untouched for four plus billion years. So we know it's complicated. We know it's heterogeneous. We know we have isolated reservoirs, but we know we have had reservoirs that have communicated with the top. And for those of you who are new in the business, I tell you, my head, sometimes I just need to go home and have a big glass of wine because my head gets very confused by all of those parameter space that I have to hold into my brain at the same time. Did I answer the OIB versus Morb conundrum? I mean, I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm never even going to get to slide two. <laughs> uh, and then, 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 then I tell you the oh, the complications come when the mineral physics community do it, and they just do it about every two to four years role played by H phase in the lower mantle. And sometimes I get it wrong. I say phase H versus H phase. Phase H is the wet one. H phase is the dry one. So <laughs> hexagonal. No, no, no. Quentin, quickly define it.
what, 1,000 kilometers deep? Two thousand, less more than more two, like 2,000. 2,000 kilometers deep? Yeah, 1,000 kilometers. Okay. May I follow? Because I have the microphone. I want to follow with a comment. Mm. <laughs> this is exactly correct, right? But I think we probably it's good for the CIDA community to be among the first people to know about the naming of the Prof's Guide. So the H phase oh. is, no, is still considered it's no longer Prof's Guide either because it's a hexagonal in structure. And the Prof's Guide phase with orthorhombic structure has been named as the Bridgmanite, which is uh, after Percy uh, Bridgman. I think not everybody knows that yet, but we are decider, so we should be the first one to know. And in the future, we're going to call that orthorhombic Prof's Guide as Bridgmanite. And this is going to remain the H phase because this has not been discovered yet. That is, they've not found a physical mineral that has that property. That's right. Good. No, no, give it to The him. community does. The, so when somebody found it in nature, this person has the right to name it after someone else, not themselves. It's Chima. Two people, Chima and Oliver Chowner. They looked for five years in shocked, shocked veins, and they found this... Uh, Orthorhombic phase, not the H phase. So the H phase remains a art, like a artificial, not mineral yet. Quentin does not seem to agree. Well, <laughs> okay. I mean, um, you know, we can he doesn't need a microphone. Things, but <laughs> we have, we have, uh, just from a semantic viewpoint, I don't. I agree with your statement that it's been named Bridgmanite, and eventually we will evolve to say Bridgmanite. But at this moment in time, I think we can say perovskite, and I don't think we'll be confused. Um, just okay. sn snarky comment. It's fine. Why Bridgman got it named after him? Only Oliver can say. It's, it's not Nick. He never worked on Perovskite. I know. So not Nick has got a, a comment to make. I can't. Nate! That's what it is. Well, the geochemical arguments, for those of us who aren't geochemists and not super familiar with that. I'll let you in the club. What, what way can you sort of try to tackle these problems from different disciplinary directions. Excellent. That actually leads to this one. First off, I'll, I'll try to answer that, but I'll try and actually set the framework from how I think about what are the possibilities. And this goes back to the theme. You just hang on to it and it will, it will migrate. Uh, the theme of the, the, the entire program, and I, I loved Bruce's opening slide, which is a picture of Io. Uh, I find that I need the mind-twisting, the mind-bending attributes of planetary sciences because it, it, it's just super cool to sort of get your brain into sort of, I tell you, there must be a dozen times a year, I think, that the uh, planet Mars must have had plate tectonics in the past just to explain or sort of justify why there's this uh, two uh, modes of topography, the, the sort of flat lowlands of the northern hemisphere and the elevated highlands of dominantly the southern hemisphere. Um, but, you know, I, I, I talk with the, the geodynamicist who, I guess it would be marodynamicist, who actually try to understand, what? Aerial. Aerial? <laughs> try to understand, actually, to explain the topography of, of uh, Mars. And in that reference frame for the geochemistry, understanding geochemical, cosmochemical models, I, I asked the question, are they comprehensive? So to put it in perspective, the first thing that someone from my viewpoint starts out with is, well, we have samples of the Earth's interior. That is, we have basalts and we have peridotites. Basalts are the lavas and peridotites. Mostly we can refer to those as the residua material from making um, basalts. So that, that begins to inform us. The next thing we'll tend to do is look at the seismological signature and make sure that whatever model we're going to create, it's going to be seismologically plausible. It's not green cheese. And then that informs, that really begs the question, what are the mineral physicists telling us? But at the, in a parallel reference frame, we start to look at meteorites. And there's no question about it. We try to find out what meteorites are telling us. And from that perspective, the first place we start is a comparison between certain meteorites and the solar photosphere composition. 
And the solar photosphere composition is, you know, that's what I was thinking when Bruce was showing that picture of the sun. I was thinking, what, were, what was the spectrographic image there? What, what was the abundance of magnesium silicon iron that we actually truly measure when we look at the solar photosphere, that is the, the, the sort of surface of the sun? And in fact, uh, without, I pointedly chose not to have three dozen slides, but a little bit later on, we'll have a presentation today by Bill White. And he'll actually relate this phenomenon, solar photosphere composition and chondrite composition. Chondrites are meteorites that are undifferentiated. So that just basically means a chondritic meteorite is this heterogeneous mixture of metal and silicate. It is what we define as the building block material for planets. When you assemble them, at some point in time, you'll gravitationally separate the metal into the center, and you'll be surrounded by a, a uh, wonderful coating of uh, silicates. So we use these chondritic meteorites to provide this reference frame. We compare it to the solar photosphere. We say, aha, six orders of magnitude, there's a one-to-one -one match for all the elements except for the gases. The noble gases don't match, hydrogen, helium, Oxygen, uh, carbon, and nitrogen don't match, but all the rest of them do match. It's one-to-one -one on a log plot. Yes, it's one-to-one -one on a log plot. But, but uh, with uncertainties, if you, I have the uncertainty diagram also, but I tend not to show that one. Um, but it, it's extremely impressive. To put that in perspective, the Earth by mass is one one millionth. So we're one ppm of the solar system. Next. Jupiter, clearly the biggie amongst all the planets, is one part in a thousand. So the planetary masses that we're sort of really tossing, uh, you know, our weight around and saying it's this is really a trace element in this solar system, really. And but nonetheless, it informs us, it informs us in a most powerful way that sort of says our quote chondritic model for the planet is is good. One thing you'll see from Bill is he'll show you the details of that, where it really gets complicated. Um, the, quote, chondritic model, well, you'll see in our literature these days, and it's really something that's only occurred in the last five years, papers that will say non-chondritic Earth models. Well, in, in, in my reference frame, I say, well, they just mean chondritic with a twist, you know, just a little bit of a difference. And, oh, even Bill's agreeing with me. That doesn't happen too often, by the way. Um, and so we really very, very much do not move forward in geochemistry without the rest of the field. We might assert a compositional model for the Earth, but we must have the seismological data to sort of back us up, the, 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 the geodynamic data, the mineral physics data, and the cosmochemistry, cosmology data that really do inform our models and constrain us. So I hope that at least gives you some insights. Um, you know, it, it scares the dickens out of me when I start to think about, you know, we've even got a number for the magnesium or the silicon content of the Earth. And personally, I'd be happy to sort of say this model doesn't work. And, and I don't care if it's a model I've put forward or somebody else put forward. I can tell you from my PhD days, I had worked on this problem. And I never thought we'd be able to actually test it, but I'm, I'm very positive we're going to be able to sort of say some of these competing models are no longer tolerable because the data that we have say we're certain at one or two sigma level that we cannot include that model. And that's, I think, the, the promise for the future. So let me just transition right now because whew, I've gotten to one-third of the way through the first slide in 25 minutes. Radiogenic power of the Earth. Uh, this is a test for uh, global scale models that's really important. And, and radioactive elements in the Earth's core is, is sort of, there's no particular order. I kept changing this. Even while I was sitting there, I changed this. Radioactive elements really contribute only some fraction, and I'll say there's a big question mark there, to the total power of the Earth. Okay, if we put our hands on this blue globe, we have a planet that's uh, radiating out about 46 plus or minus 3 terawatts of power. And it's a very big question in our field. How much of that 46 uh, terawatts of power is due to the inheritance of primordial energy? 
Primordial energy would represent in two major terms the energy of accretion. We have 6 times uh, 10 to the 24 kilograms of mass. The incoming would be about 20 kilometers a second. It gives us 10 to the 30 plus joules of energy as a starting point. We have zero. He, he said initial conditions. I'm going to say we have zero real uh, insights as to how fast we dissipated that, en that energy and how much we just failed at dissipating in the first 100 million years and we're stuck with that we have today. So that question is, that's one form of the primordial energy. The second form of the primordial energy is really the formation of the Earth's core. The Earth's core, you know, from tungsten isotopes, another isotope system you'll not want to hear about, from tungsten isotope systems, we really feel confident that the formation of the Earth's core happened sometime as really as early as 10 to 15 million years ago uh, after T0 to something like less than 100 million years after T0. And, and why do we say something older 100 million years? It all depends on when the, uh, the moon formed. So if we actually know the, the weekday that the moon formed, we can constrain core formation. But we know core formation happened pretty early. And we know that because of the bulk composition of the moon, there was actually a fairly significant segregation of the metal from the silicate. It wasn't an intimate mixture. So these are the kinds of constraints we have. And these are the time constraints. Anybody going to disagree with that sort of time frame? Rich, you like that one? Boy, you can't get him awake for hours in the morning. He shrugs his shoulders. I, you know, I don't mind a little controversy, but I think, I, uh, you know, Ching Shu, you'd agree, maybe as young as 13? Yes, I know, because you put that number out. Define core formation. Oh, that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll actually get to that, and I suspect that Rich will talk a little bit later. When I, yeah, define formation of the Earth, define core formation, really oftentimes we're talking about some functional number that might be 60, 70 percent, not 100 percent. Why? Because it, it didn't happen on a Thursday. It didn't happen at a discrete moment. We actually have a transition. But when we start to have core formation, it's probably a process that accelerates really, once it happens, it accelerates really rapidly. But it has a long tail to it. So we don't define it as 90 or 100 percent, but we define it as approximately when the time, uh, the mean time, something like 60, 70 percent of metal was separated away from silicate, no longer metal silicate equilibrium. So that would be how we think of core formation. Likewise, formation of the moon really is, for the most part, that impact event. Okay? There's an impact event, there's spallation of materials strung out around, the, but we can define the moon formation as the oldest rocks on the moon. We can't tell you when, how long it took to assemble the body. Bill. I, I, think, I think it was formation, core formation differently. Core formation happened already for the most part in the planetesimals that that accreted to form the Earth, that collided with each other. So we've already we're accreting bodies that already segregated cores. And then of course one has to merge the cores in, in this growing planet. But really we think about the Earth. The Earth starts out with a bunch of little bodies which all have evolved to a certain degree by themselves. Jackie, do you believe that? <laughs> this surprises me because I remember Lee and Agee tells me that the mean uh, pressure of core formation, you use this. Right, right. It will really equilibrate at some uh, nominal depth, right? Average depth, maybe. But so I do you believe brought in pre differentiated, but it wasn't until you were a much bigger body. Keep going, come on. I'm done. Oh. <laughs> so I do want to point that out. I mean, in fact, uh, good, good geochemists there, and just okay that sounds. But, but, you know, we actually don't know. We very frequently believe that there were pre differentiated planetesimals that came in, maybe something the size of the moon, maybe something a lot smaller. Pre differentiated bodies come in with their own little cores, their own little mantles. But at least if we're talking about Lee and Agee or other constraints, we find that the 
compositional signature of elements that are probably in the core, that are really depleted in the mantle, really inform us to say that on average, that's what we can best talk about. We can't talk about anything specific. On average, metal silicate equilibration happened between 500 and 1,000 kilometers deep, right? And that's where it's best explained. So we have, oh my God, if you read something like uh, O'Neill 91 or Wade and Wood. I think it's. Yeah. Hi, I'm Liz, Liz Cottrell. Um, you just said that you thought we knew that there, w we are, I don't, were you saying we certain feel strongly. That, there, that we, that the earth records a single stage equilibration? No, no. On average, I said. Oh, okay. On average in space and time. Yes. And composition, I guess I would yeah. say. On average, between 500 and 1,000 kilometer depth pressure range. On average means that some of it happened at one atmosphere pressures and some of it happened at probably, you know, 80 GPA. But on average, the best we could say is that let's say the cobalt nickel ratio is strikingly chondritic and we can't figure out how to make that happen unless we have uh, elevated pressure. And on average in time too. Oh certainly, but at the same time we believe that core formation on average happened, it could have happened as quickly as uh, a million years after T0, but the bulk of the core formed uh, that is something 60 to 70 percent, uh, formed over the time period, here's our constraint, perhaps as little as 10 to 15 million years after T0 and 100 plus million years after T0. And that's on average. That's all we can say. So, so those are the kinds of constraints. And I hope actually we have these kinds of conversations throughout all of the talks because, you know, if you don't see the, the sort of message I'm trying to deliver, um, and you hear these contrasting views, that's actually where we sit with our information base, and it's sometimes very difficult to pull that information out. And back to the radioactive elements in the Earth's core, I mean, Bruce, it's easily 15, 20 years that we've gone back and forth. The people who actually try to calculate the, the uh, power in the geodynamo have frequently said, uh, we don't know when the inner core began crystallizing, but we, if, if it's going to be crystallizing relatively midway through, say, 2 billion years, we need so much radioactive power. And if it's going to be crystallizing starting only a half a billion years, we need a little less radioactive power with uh, earlier crystallization. Um, but at the same time, just actually maintaining the geodynamo, we may need a little bit of extra um, re uh, power in the Earth's core. And so frequently I've been asked, what is your idea of view perspective on radioactive elements in the Earth's core? There's really only three players in this, thorium, uranium, and potassium. Okay? And um, everybody sort of agrees, but that doesn't mean it's a solved problem. Forget thorium. Thorium doesn't seem to want to go in the metal phase. Um, and it doesn't even want to go in all that much into a sulfide phase. So the real question is, is there uranium in the Earth's core, or is there potassium in the Earth's core, or is there potassium and uranium in the Earth's core? And in fact, petrologists are a clever group of people. They will go into the kitchen, they will put all the ingredients into a little bowl, they'll mix it up and stick it in the oven, and lo and behold, they will find a potassium sulfide phase that will happily go into the Earth's core. Does that mean it happened? Oh, there was an answer, it sounded like. Door number two? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, all I can say is, not in my Earth, okay? That doesn't mean it didn't happen in their Earth, but it didn't happen in my Earth, okay? The other thing I, I frequently like to point out, and this is really what we all tend to go to, is we, we tend to go to the one-stop shopping store when we stare in front of the periodic table. So what will happen to potassium will happen to lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, what's the next one? Cesium <laughs> and francium. Yes, actually, I, you know, the periodic table is embedded in my brain, and any time a, a, a petrologist says, this happened to this element, I go, what about these elements? 
and so this is another aspect that often has to be talked about um, in terms of trying to understand the radioactive element budget of the Earth's core. The answer is, it's there if you want it to be, and there will be some geochemists who will say, it ain't there, so we don't know, and we can't disprove it. Okay. 142 signature, that will be talked about a lot, and uh, I'll tell you, our, our community, we don't agree, right, Bill? Right. Right. But it's the newest, uh, latest thing out. It's been out around a decade. This isotopic uh, in signature really is really informing us about the complexities and the richness of signals that were available four and a half billion years ago as we were forming the solar system. And why we have these heterogeneities really need to be explained. And some people see this as saying, we don't look like this family of meteorites. Therefore, we're missing some component in the Earth's system. It's either hidden deep inside the Earth, or somehow we've magically removed it. And the word magically is not meant to be disrespectful. It really is that we either say that the Earth is a different type of chondrite, or the Earth is the chondrites that we know, and that it's either hidden deep, or we've lost it. Okay, so that's what this 142 signature is. And it really gets back to what are the building blocks of the planets, the chondrites. Which chondrites? We don't know that. Timing of inner core crystallization, I hit that question. I mean, I mean Rich Walker, uh, there's a great team of Maryland geochemists and geophysicists here. Rich, Ved, myself, Nick's going to be here. Uh, Rich and I have completely disagreed or approached this topic from a very, a very different perspective. Rich sees that some of the signals in Hawaiian basalts particularly, uh, in osmium isotope space, indicate to him that there's been differentiation inside the Earth's core and that there's been small amounts of material that have been mass transferred between the Earth's core and the surface of the Earth. And it provides us with a constraint on how early Earth's inner core formation uh, began. And in many ways, the geodynamicist says, well, this can't be right. I, I need my inner core to form very late. Rich says, I need my inner core to form very early. We don't know who's right. And it really is a very, very interesting perspective. So the timing of the inner core crystallization actually is a question in the power of the geodynamo. And it's a question in the geochemical community as to whether or not there's core mantle exchange and whether or not there's fractionation between rhenium and osmium between the inner and outer core as a result of this. And it provides a constraint on the possibility when the inner core began crystallizing. So it's really interesting interface between all of them. And then, uh, measuring the geo neutrino flux of the Earth. Just uh, who here has never heard the word geo neutrinos before? Yeah, come on, come on. Oh, wait until I get a hold of you. <laughs> uh, I'll just go right on, but I'll leave you wondering. Age and formation of the moon. I think I've covered a lot of that. You know, there's only a few minutes left, so I've got core, uh, post-core formation. That's I think I highlighted that. Oldest lunar rocks. That's the time frame. Uh, during a super rotational stage of the Earth, I didn't know how to frame it, but I like the new models that are coming out that the Earth was spinning fast. You know, I want days to go longer. I don't want days to go shorter. <laughs> how long was a day back in back in the day? Yeah, only a couple of hours. Uh, you know, it's really kind of oh that you know in terms of mind-bending space, you know, we we all know that the moon runs around the Earth uh, and it takes about 28 days, and the distance is about 400,000 kilometers between the center of the two bodies. Well, Jupiter and Io are the same sort of thing. They're separated by about uh, 400,000 kilometers, and. Uh, it, do we have people unknowledgeable about this? I don't want some of you smarty pants. Do you have a guess as to how long I it? I, I, I want to hear from the uninformed. How, how fast do you think Io would go? Oh, come on, you have to be. You, come on, be, be brave. How fast do you think Io runs around Jupiter? It takes 28 days for the moon to run around the Earth. Come on, come on. Timo, do you know? No All right, give a guess. 28 days? A lot less. A lot less. What is it, about day and three quarters? Oh, Earth days. About a day and three quarters, I think. Something like that. Yeah, about a day and three quarters for Io to run around Jupiter. Remember, Jupiter is a thousand times more massive than us. 
Isn't that cool? I mean, if you think about that, that's a, one of those, uh, what I think is a mind bender. These two bodies are separated by about the same distance. One is a thousand times bigger. And, and Io and the moon are the same size. One signal, they're the same size. And that one just runs around. And that's why Io is erupting like crazy. That's why it's so hot. It's really through, due to tidal friction. I got to get quick kicking here. So, you know, this is sort of thinking about these mechanics. Compositional difference with the Earth. Yeah, the two bodies are different. Wow, I'm going to get on to the second slide. <laughs> second slide. All right, well, light element in the core, age of core formation, age and introduction of late veneer. Rich tells me I shouldn't use that word, but I'm going to use it for now. And then secular evolution of the mantle. This is sort of the agenda for the week, or the next couple of weeks. Uh, light element in the Earth's core is something that is is you know constantly talked about. Yes, was that a hand raise? Why not? Do you have a preference for the light element in the Earth's core? You don't give a crap. You know, <laughs> not supposed to say that. Uh, Jackie didn't like the order I had. She thought it implied something. Well, I changed it to this order, which was somewhat neutral, going from uh, lightest to the heaviest. But the bottom line constraints here is really some sort of dependence on the oxygen fugacity or the gas fugacity during um, core formation. Um, and it, it didn't have to be constant, as, as uh, Liz highlighted. And Liz will bring, at some level, a perspective on, on the uh, oxidation state of the Earth's interior and maybe only the mantle. But at some point in time, the mantle might have been more reduced, and therefore the equilibrium between the core and the mantle would have been established at that point. Some people think that in a very reduced state, we can put a lot of silicon into the core. And in fact, we can also possibly put titanium into the Earth's core under the reduced state. And we go, wait a second, now I'll give you some real geochemistry speak. As a geochemist, I immediately say, well, the aluminum-titanium ratio is chondritic. Oh my god, how'd you know that? Yeah, these are the things I know. And that, for me, places a constraint. You can't put a lot of titanium in the Earth's core. So if you're going to put silicon in the Earth's core, you've got to say, well, how much titanium went into the Earth's core? And that's how I would frame it in my mind. But, so the question is that we have a density deficit, and we don't know how to solve the problem of the density deficit of the Earth's core. What does it mean? If you go back to even uh, uh, Percy Bridgman, what was his student's name? Ah, Birch. <laughs> yeah, Francis Birch in the 50s sort of said, hey, look, at the, the density of iron at the uh, uh, core temperatures and pressures is X. The density of uh, the Earth's uh, core is Y. There seems to be about a 10% difference. And in fact, as I was reading the literature from the 70s and the 80s, it was sort of saying 10%. And I actually didn't understand this. And I really like this paper by, is it Orson Anderson around 2006? where he actually sort of showed the trade-off in temperature versus density space. And so it really, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, well, we need about 6% silicon and 2% sulfur, et cetera. And I go, oh, so you know the temperature at the core cool mantle boundary or the inner core, outer core boundary. And last week, we actually debated that for a long time. And, and, and you know, we know within 1,000 degrees, depending upon where your central value is, you know, because if you take sort of 4,000, you, you know, sort of, it might be 3,500, it might be 4,500, but I think give it 10 years, it will change. I'm Bill. I'm Bill. Simon. Yes, but I think you would agree it's a... Yeah, it's like pretty bad. Lots of votes for bad over here. Microphones, microphones. Yeah, it, it's bad. It's, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've just seen... <laughs> 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 I've just seen... 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 I've just se
Okay, I think that the temperature at the core mantle boundary can be fairly robustly upper bounded from the possible presence of a minimal amount of melt, or if you prefer not to have melt there, no melt if you'd like that, but you are certainly bracketed on the upper side by the temperature of melting of mantle assemblages. So that's a very robust upper bound. And on the, <laughs> we, have a, we have a decent constraint on that. So you like it's the Tokyo horrible. Tech number, right? I'm not going to say I like the Tokyo Tech number, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that you don't want to go too much above 4,000 K at the core mantle boundary is what I would say. Maybe 4,200, maybe 4,300, but then you get massive melting occurring at the core mantle boundary if you believe the uh, current peridotite melting curves or the basalt melting curves at those uh, depths. So call it 4,300 as a max. And then you can decide how much of a non-adiabatic increase you want within the transition zone or deeper. And so you actually get a decent constraint at the core mantle boundary on the, on the temperature bound, which is not so very terrible, let's put it that way. And then, you know, the question is that you raise is, if you go from the core side, how much of an effect does five weight percent alloying component loosely or three weight percent alloying component within the inner core have on the phase relations? The jury's out on that, but I would say that the, the best guess is that it's probably not incredibly profound. It's not 1,000K, for example. So I, I'm not as pessimistic as you just phrased it. Let me put it that way. Uh, Qu Quentin, would you say that our, uh, our best temperature in the Earth's interior is the 410 seismic discontinuity? Well, I, I'd say it's dig a hole and it's a meter down. But yeah, but we know but that. Yeah, it's exactly. Uh, I mean, the 410 is well determined, sure. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, the 410 is a good map in terms of an FO88 composition of right. temperature as a function of depth. And that's actually my starting point is, I say that's the only number we really have pinned down on the Earth's mm -hmm. interior. Well, we have bounds elsewhere, so bounds. you're being pessimistic. It seems to me that the melting temperature of iron in the core is beginning to converge, isn't it? Why, yes, I would say it is. <laughs> and I, I don't want to plump too much here, but um, yeah, I think, I think we are at a level right now where we have converged on relatively high melting temperatures for iron. I think you're absolutely right. And I think the convergence that will take place is associated with the lighter alloying components, which I think the jury is still out on what the detailed effects of the lighter alloying components are. If many people missed iron by a lot for a long time, and I'm not going to name any names, um, then the question is how much were the alloys missed by as well. Right. I've put it in perspective for the uh, scientists who haven't been reading the literature since the 1990s. It was about 1990 when there was really this sort of big controversy and they even had it, uh, I, I can't th remember his name from California who, not, not, I'm not talking about Raymond, who came in and weighed in on the various camps of what is the temperature uh, of the melting point for iron. I remember, I can't remember his name. But, yeah, I can't either. Uh, but this was a big controversy and if you talk about it now, I mean, we're at a very, very robust stage where actually there is a convergence on that number, whereas there was there was wars going on back then. Really? <laughs> From my perspective, there was. Ooh, plus minus 700. That could I, I be think a convergence? That again, again, I think that it depends on what pressure you're talking about. If you are talking at the absolute inner core, outer core boundary, I would probably agree that I would put it plus minus 500, but that's detailed. No, she was. Uh, we're talking strictly about the melting temperature of pure iron. Where? At what pressure, though? At the inner core boundary. That's it's important to specify what pressure it's at, because I don't think you would say that for the core mantle boundary. Right. Okay. I'd say it's much smaller. And in fact, if we're going to put this all in perspective, we probably have to recognize that the inner core has a dense, uh, a, a not iron density uh, value, and though, therefore it must have also a light element component. I, I itself. But I mean, this is a big question. In fact, last week we were talking about using atmospheric neutrinos to actually look at the density state of the Earth's interior. And, and really, I, I'll, I'll challenge the seismologists. In fact, I still think that the outstanding paper of the day is uh, Masters and Gubbins on the density deficit difference between the inner core and the outer core. And that's 20% uncertain. Barbara's back there going, not those. <laughs> but you know, if I'm wrong, I wait to see the. 
Yeah. I'd like to see a better paper. <laughs> yeah. Well, you point it out and, and show me the, uh, the value for the uncertainty because, in fact, I remember it's like 0.82 plus or minus 17%, if I remember in my brain the number. And if somebody says we know it more precise than that, I've been asked by particle physicists how well we know that number and what's their target goal. So that's why I ask that oftentimes. Um, volatile depletion trend for the Earth. That actually informs this question, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, sulfur. How much sulfur was available to go into the Earth's core? I remember back in the early 80s, people were very definitive. Um, the light element in the Earth's core was sulfur, and it's 10% sulfur. And that was uh, written almost a, in dogmatic way in, in the literature. Um, I have this really uh, respectful image of the volatility curve plus a data point which would represent 10% sulfur in the Earth's core. And then I have the international symbol for it. it's not happening, a circle with a line through it in the middle. I personally think um, I'd like to flush out of people's minds the idea that the Earth's core has 10% sulfur in it um, because I really think that the, the abundance of evidence, even if we uh, accreted pre-differentiated planetesimals, really point to the fact that this planet is depleted in volatiles unlike, I'm going to repeat this, unlike any meteorite, chondritic, or otherwise that we're familiar with. The only one planet, uh, the only body that I know is more depleted in volatile elements is the moon. I mean, uh, <laughs> what? Uh, do I want to go there? Well, I mean, we can start talking about it if it's dripping wet or not. But, you know, the sum of the data from the moon, even the potassium-uranium ratio that have been done by surveys over the thing, is that that ratio is one quarter that on the Earth. And potassium's a volatile element. Uranium's a refractory element. So there is no question in my mind that actually both the Earth and the moon are grossly depleted. C1 chondrite is a factor of eight more richer in potassium than our body is in terms of the KU ratio. So the planet Earth is definitively depleted in potassium, a volatile element. Well, it clearly doesn't have anywhere near the water content of a C1 chondrite. And I would say that it's depleted in a systematic way that allows me to say that there's some volatility trend Okay, so there's a depletion. Uh, and that would represent, I have no idea how it was, but the average, the integrated signal at one astronomical unit out from the sun over, you know, probably a hundred million year time frame, that kind of representation. So that's a sort of a working point. We have a volatile depleted planet, and this might inform how much hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen there is in the, uh, in the outer core. We don't know. In fact, I do want to mention that the particle physicists think, well, if the, there's a lot of uh, hydrogen in the Earth's core, who's, who suggested that? <laughs> Williams? Yeah, among yeah. others, among others. <laughs> you know, actually, Fukai you know, was first. <laughs> yeah. Um, we might even actually have a new probe using atmospheric neutrinos to look at whether or not the Earth's core has significant amounts of hydrogen. We just don't know. Um, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. We've covered it. Let's go to core formation. We've covered this. There are certain isotope systems. Uranium lead isotope system. Um, I, I was re again reminded, oh, but Halliday and Wood told us about the uranium lead age of core formation. You know, I'm being recorded, Alex, uh, Bernie. Mm -mm. I'm not, I'm not going to go there. I'm basically going to say that we're still uncertain about the f age of uh, core formation, and they've put together a very nice hypothesis, but it really is very, very dependent upon a number of parameters, not the least of which is uranium is a refractory element, but lead is a very volatile element. So how much lead is actually in the entire planet, how much lead is actually in the Earth's core is an enormous question mark. And if we don't know how much lead is in the, in, the, in the Earth's core, then we really do not have a tight constraint. We have a consistency in making a uranium lead age for the Earth's core. So, so there is some constraints, but these are the three biggies. The age of core formation really is best underpinned by the tungsten hafnium isotope system. There's some very good informational perspectives from the uranium lead system. And it should have happened well before core formation, you know, because we have a lot of uh, iron in this planet and not that much iron in the moon. Age and introduction of the late veneer. Um, the late veneer might also be called the uh, 
not late heavy bombardment. Rich, what's the word I'm looking for? Late accretion. Late accretion. So a as we were talking about the average of the system, you know, we form the bulk of the body. But there's a long tail. How do we know that? Well, you know, we have meteorites falling uh, every day on this planet. And really, they're insignificant as to how much was added. But one thing we do know is the abundance of the highly siderophile elements. Think of them as the noble metals. Ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, iridium, osmium, platinum. These metals, their abundance, both absolute and relative in the Earth's mantle, are a head scratcher. And there have been observations which says that the you know, the rhenium-osmium, uh, the osmium-iridium ratio is chondritic. Well, we can't do that by experimental petrology, but then Liz Contrell says, we can do that by experimental studies, right? Well, platinum, yeah, she goes like this, she goes, this was part of my very controversial PhD. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I mean, there's a healthy debate. <laughs> Yes, during the during the, the couple of weeks, but you would agree that. I'm only here this week. Oh, good. We'll really talk about it next week then. Uh, I think that uh, work since has shown that for some elements, uh, like platinum, there have been additional studies to show that yeah, it it could work, but that for other elements, um, osmium, for example, that you that you do probably need. Uh, late accretion. I mean, at some level, we know that late accretion occurred. Mm -hmm. Meteorites continue to fall. So um, mm -hmm. I think the, the place to look for constraints is, is the moderately siderophile elements, not the heavy siderophile elements for conditions of core formation. The moderately siderophile elements um, are the elements that we want to look at to understand the process of core formation and that the highly siderophile elements will tell us more about later stage processes. Um, there's just as a side note, there's also a dynamical need for uh, a late accretion. But that doesn't necessarily have to correspond exactly with what people talk about in terms of late linear geochemistry. But if you take uh, a planetary formation simulation, you get to the last stage, you have gun impact, everything is very, very excited. Uh, and so you need an accretion, you need a sort of mass around that's accreted to damp down the eccentricities, what's called the system in order to get it to what we have today. So there is both a, a geochemical what we observe, but also uh, dynamics that struggle to get to the solar system we know with how we form it currently without having some mass really accreted. Whether that's recorded geochemistry, we can argue from that. Nate, does that help you? This is another way we can look at the system. And I, I personally am so thrilled that I've not even gotten through two slides, set, uh, two slides to really do this. Because, in fact, I couldn't have said you know, the dynamics of the situation, but I'm going to pay attention to that. And that's really where I think all of us should be informing all of us, really, is to be strong about your evidence, be strong about what you think is you bring to the table, but also be in this environment, be really quick to be spending time not with your intimate science partner, but you know, with somebody else who really brings a different perspective. It's really important. I'm just going to skip all of this because I want a coffee break. Uh, and you, <laughs> yes, Liz, don't you like listening to me go on and on for hours? <laughs> yes, yeah, say yes. No, she's not going to say that. <laughs> Let's see. Secular, ev yeah. You know, it'll be it'll be really interesting if we start talking about crystallization of a magma ocean, uh, and not just that word, but if we had irreversible differentiation, if we actually separated phases A from a melt and actually sunk it down to the bottom of the mantle and hit it there, because we're always asking that question. I'm going to leave all of that. And I'm going to give you a takeaway message. <laughs> Liz, does that actually go back to the question we both could be wrong? <laughs> uh, Bill White will be talking later in the afternoon. And we, have, we play golf together, but we disagree frequently. And every once in a while, I go, if I get a hole in one, will you just agree with me forever? <laughs> Thank you.